Okay, it looks like uh, the joins are slowing down, so I'll kind of introduce. This is uh, the Privacy Pass BOF at IETF 107, uh, one of the virtual BOFs we are having this week. Um, there's a couple things to go over here. Uh, one is uh, obviously this session is being uh, recorded. Um, also, please make sure your video is off to kind of conserve bandwidth. Um, you should mute your microphone unless you're speaking to prevent background noise. Uh, for queue management, we're going to use the WebEx chat window. Um, you can use plus Q to add yourself to the chat queue, to the uh, microphone queue, and uh, minus Q to remove yourself from the queue. So that should be primarily what we're using the uh, chat window for in WebEx. Um, other kind of conversation should be used in the uh, uh, Jabber room. Uh, we may also use the chat uh, maybe for, for a couple other purposes, but we'll, chairs will let you know when it's appropriate to use the chat outside of the plus Q minus Q. Um, as I mentioned before, the virtual blue sheets are in the etherpad, also when where the notes are being uh, taken. So. Uh, you just may need to scroll down or up to, to find the section uh, where you can log your name in. Um, and finally, uh, we do have a Jabber room. Uh, please join. I think you have a couple folks monitoring uh, that room. Um, so to get started, um, your chairs today are, I'm, I'm Joe Salloway, and uh, we also have uh, Ben Schwartz. I don't know, Ben, if you want to say hi. Hi, this is Ben. I'll be managing the microphone queue in the chat. So please uh, enter the queue with plus Q and then wait for me to call your name before speaking. Uh, when you speak, please reiterate your name just in case the note takers missed it the first time. Okay. So you're probably all familiar with uh, NoteWell but uh, we'll put this up anyway to remind folks for a minute or so. Um, so please uh, make sure all of the uh, uh, you know, rules about participation are followed. Um, okay, so here we are. Uh, we're gonna start out with, um, we've gone through the administrivia. We'll start out with a just description of kind of the problem statement and use cases from Alex Davidson of what privacy pass is to give everybody an idea. After that, we will want to um, get a sense of the call if people understand what, what this is all about. Um, and then we can kind of go and on and uh, see what uh, uh, the status of implementations um, and uh, the status of the drafts are and Stephen Valdez will, will uh, present on that. So there'll be time after each presentation to uh, kind of ask clarifying questions to, to understand more. Um, and then finally, uh, we'll, we'll continue on and look at a possible charter. So are there any uh, questions or comments at this point? If not, we'll just jump in. Um, I'll display the slides, Alex, and you can unmute yourself and talk. Hi, this is Alex. You can Oops. hear me okay? Hold on. This is not the ideal. Uh... There we go. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, that works. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, I'm Alex. I'm a cryptography researcher at Cloudflare. Um, so as Jay mentioned, I'm just going to be walking through some of the uh, the, the problem that we're looking to solve with Privacy Pass and some of the applications and use cases uh, that currently exist. Uh, so next slide, please. Cool. So um, if you don't know, Privacy Pass um, is a protocol intended for the internet setting and um, specifically uh, to provide a privacy preserving protocol for providing proofs of trust satisfaction. And by privacy preserving here, we intend to preserve the privacy of clients who are providing these proofs. So uh, this protocol was first announced in conjunction with the CDN Cloudflare in November 2017. Uh, there's a browser extension which you can use for uh, Google Chrome and Firefox, which is quite widely used. 
But uh, more recently, we've also seen uh, usage and development by other organizations, such as the Chromium and Brave browsers. Uh, next slide, please. So the problem that we're looking to solve with Privacy Pass um, is uh, quite a common one. So we have a client in the server, and the client makes a request to the server, and the server has to decide whether to accept that request and process it or not. Uh, so this request, we're imagining something to be like, uh, give me access to this resource, or please register this action. And uh, the server will want to know, where, uh, want to have some indication of whether the client um, is honest or not um, before it accepts that request. Uh, next slide, please. So to do this, um, typically what the server will do is issue some sort of challenge to the client. Uh, the client will have to solve this challenge before its uh, request is processed. So in the internet setting, this can be something like a Turing test. And essentially what the server is trying to do here is, access, uh, is to de determine whether the client is human or not, uh, uh, due to the fact that humans are more likely to be honest when they're accessing websites. And once the client has provided a solution to this challenge, the server will accept the request and process it. And here we can think of the server either as just a standard server uh, providing resources or a server as some sort of gateway uh, that provides access to a number of disparate services that the client can access. So next slide, please. So the problem here is uh, when it comes to propagating that trust. So in the situation previously, the client would have to solve a challenge every time it needs to prove to the server uh, that it's honest. But something that would be really valuable is for the um, client to be able to uh, propagate that trust to future requests so they don't have to keep solving these challenges. So what this would look like is the server provides some sort of trust attestation token and the client would use this token in future requests when interacting with that server so that the um, server could accept the request without having to process another challenge from the client. Uh, so next slide please. So um, this all seems well and good, but there were some uh, major concerns with this model. So um, if we think of a trust attestation as uh, some sort of cookie, which is usually the way things are done, um, there's firstly very limited functionality that we can get in the internet setting. So um, if the server is some sort of gateway and the client is accessing resources on different origins, then this cookie is not going to work because uh, the requests will be cross-origin requests. And equally, if, if the trust attestation token is something more powerful than a cookie, then this could lead to the server being able to map the client's browsing patterns and sub subsequently link the sessions together, especially if the services that the server is uh, serving are disparate and don't know anything about each other. So this is going to substantially harm the client's privacy when browsing. So with a lack of alternatives, um, the, the next best thing is just the client solving a challenge on each request. Uh, but the problem is here is uh, these uh, challenges can be quite expensive and they can also be harmful to accessibility to clients. And in some situations, they can also be infeasible. If the client is, say, is trying to uh, provide some proof of ownership of an attribute, but it doesn't want to reveal what that attribute exactly is. So we need a different solution. Uh, so next slide, please. So this is where Privacy Pass comes in. So Privacy Pass um, specifically is a protocol uh, for producing unforgeable tokens. Uh, that allow clients to attest to some uh, to the ownership of some attribute they owns. And the key property of the Privacy Pass protocol is that the tokens that are redeemed are unlinkable from those that were originally issued. So, in other words, um, the tokens when they're redeemed with the server do not reveal how or when they were created, even if even though the server um, it themselves issued them. Uh, so, next slide, please. So, how does this fit into the workflow? Uh, that I brought up earlier. So we have the challenge and uh, solution that the client uh, provided uh, previously, but it also provides an extra message, which is the request tokens. So this requests some privacy pass tokens from the privacy pass server. And then when the server decides to accept the challenge solution, it also issues some tokens to the client. And this is uh, known as the token issuance phase. And next slide, please. So in a future request, uh, the server may issue a challenge or the client may just uh, send a redeem token message itself. And this redeem token message entitles the client to bypass whatever challenge the server wants to uh, provide to the client. So the key thing here is that the, the client no longer has to provide a solution to the challenge. And uh, these redemption tokens, as I mentioned before, are unlinkable by design. So the client can use these across origins and the server, 
and it does not reveal to the server uh, when they were issued and uh, the client doesn't have, have to process these extra challenges. Uh, so next slide, please. So how does it work? Um, so the underlying uh, mechanism uh, for the privacy pass protocol is this cryptographic protocol for computing what is known as a verifiable oblivious pseudo-random function. I'm not going to go into the exact details of what one of these uh, constructions is, um, but there is a draft specification that's currently been worked on by the CFRG, so you can uh, read that. And um, in the protocol document for privacy pass, which Stephen will talk about in his uh, session, uh, just after this one, um, we we implement the privacy pass API using this functionality. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the additional costs, so we're just uh, talking about the additional cryptographic data we have to send in order to um, instantiate the privacy pass protocol. So we, for the issuance phase, we have the request tokens and issue tokens messages. And these messages are proportional to the number of tokens uh, that are being issued to the client multiplied by essentially the size of the cipher suite we're using. So here, uh, the 65 bytes corresponds to the largest cipher suites uh, being used in the VOPMF draft. So these messages are going to be less than or equal to uh, 65 bytes per token. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the redemption phase, the redeem token is much smaller as a constant size, essentially corresponding to an authentication tag, which will be around 64 bytes. For the computation, I'm just going to be focusing on the public key cryptography operations because these ones are going to be uh, the most expensive. So these essentially correspond to the same operations in the TLS uh, handshake. So in the issuance phase, we have um, a slightly more expensive um, set of computations. So the client and server perform three or four of these public key operations per token. But in the redemption phase, we have a much uh, less expensive um, computation, so the client doesn't have to perform any of these, and the server just performs one to validate uh, the token. Uh, so next slide, please. So moving on to the applications, as I mentioned before, um, PricePass uh, came out uh, in collaboration with the Cloudflare CDN. So the Cloudflare CDN uses PricePass as an abuse prevention mechanism um, in order to improve accessibility to clients. Uh, that interact with Cloudflare's internet captures, which they use to protect their customer websites. So essentially, what happens is when a customer, when a Cloudflare, um, or when a uh, a client interacts with Cloudflare and has to perform a capture, if they have the Privacy Pass browser extension installed, uh, the Cloudflare CDN will also provide the user with Privacy Pass tokens. And when a user then navigates to other origins that are behind the Cloudflare CDN, they can provide these tokens and they won't and they don't have to complete uh, the captures and the unlinkable property means that Cloudflare can't map the user's um, browser patterns, uh, browsing patterns. And a second case, use case, which um, also corresponds to the abuse prevention application is related more to the online ad platform space. So essentially, um, the uh, ad space providers uh, can use privacy pass tokens to um, ensure that ad clicks are being made by non-fraudulent actors. So what this means is uh, ad space providers need to be able to ensure that clicks on uh, specific ads are made by uh, by clients that aren't bots, and uh, they can use the privacy pass tokens to propagate uh, trust. And there are two applications which highlight this uh, use case. So. Firstly, the Trust Token API, which again, Stephen will talk about next in his talk, is uh, an API that intends to be uh, used in browsers, and the Chromium browser is registered and intent to implement, and essentially will just provide the ability to use the Privacy Pass protocol to propagate trust uh, over HTTP. And Facebook have also highlighted uh, a use case, which is based on a variant of the Privacy Pass protocol with slightly different cryptographic um, implementation uh, that essentially for the same application. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and the second application which we've seen uh, quite recently is one based around anonymous currency. So the Brave browser um, allows Brave clients to uh, use these uh, this form of currency known as basic attention tokens or BATS to uh, purchase services internally in the browser. And uh, Brave uses a variant of the privacy fast protocol to provide uh, these bats to clients. So essentially, the clients have to perform some authorized uh, actions, such as watching a sanctioned advertisement. And when they do that, they receive privacy pass tokens, and these privacy pass tokens can be cashed in for bats without uh, being able to link back to the initial uh, authorization. 
secondly, um, we have uh, an application based on providing anonymous receipts for prepaid services. So, uh, least authority, the security consultancy, uh, use Privacy Pass as a mechanism for providing proof of purchase and uh, for an access control mechanism, uh, mechanism linked to their private storage API. And this is also an application highlighted by the Open Privacy Group. So next slide, please. So yeah, just to finish up, um, and just uh, to conclude, so Privacy Pass um, is intended for the internet setting, and uh, we think it, it provides quite unique properties as a trust-based uh, attestation mechanism uh, for uh, propagation of trust on the internet. And uh, we, want, we hope to form a working group that will standardize the usage of the protocol and the specific implementation considerations around creating an ecosystem around that that includes multiple issuing, issuing servers and multiple clients. And there are many open questions around this. And again, these will be covered uh, in, another, in Stephen's presentation. Um, but yeah, happy to answer any clarifying questions around uh, the problem and use cases. Thank you. OK. Uh, we now have. Uh, we now have some questions. Dave Thaler, you're first up. Hi, this is Dave Thaler. My question is back on slide eight, I think it was, um, which was about the problems. Actually, maybe the, the slides are on this. This is fine to leave up on the screen. I have two questions. Um, one is, do you see the scope of this as, uh, I guess, this uh, presentation, this protocol, this BOF, as being uh, web context specific or more general than just web? That's the first of two questions. And then my second question is, um, what's, what do we think the relationship is between this problem? And I'm, again, my questions are on the problem space, right? Not the solution, on the problem space. Um, what's the relationship, what do we think the relationship is between this problem and the problem that the RATS working group has tried to solve, given that that one is about attestation too? Um, now, I will... Uh, give a partial answer to that myself, which is the RATS group is chartered to do architecture. And so if you look at the diagrams here, they match almost identical to what the RATS group has, but the RATS group is not chartered to do protocol. And so it could be that the relationship is RATS does the architecture and some of the formats, but then not the protocol. And maybe that's what you're trying to do here, but I'm not sure if that's, uh, if that's consistent with what you think. So again, first question was, is this web only or more than just web? And question number two is what's the relationship to RATS? Uh, like, yeah. So it, uh, so that I think the scope of this working group is uh, web only in the sense that um, I, I think Privacy Pass itself as a protocol could be used in different situations, but the, I think the scope of the proposed working group would just be in the web context. Um, on RATS, that's not something I know so much about, but um, happy to have more discussion on that. I, I, yeah, I have to admit, I don't actually know too much about that working group. I okay, thank you. Uh I think it is very closely related, and my comment is just the more closely it is, the more coordination and less duplication there should be. Thank you. Uh, just to jump in quick as AD, this is Ben Kaduk. Um, my understanding is that RATS is interested in providing sort of verifiable information about the you know, client or the, the entity itself, and that many of the use cases here from Privacy Pass are not as much about the entity as opposed to something like something that has done uh, roughly like a proof of work. Um, so uh, not all sure. I can say is both diagrams match exactly the diagrams that's in the RATS architecture right now. And so, for example, you're trying to, the server is asking the client to attest that the client is a human and not a bot, for example. And so you have a capture or something like that. The thing that comes back is the equivalent to what RATS would call evidence. And then the token that gets issued is equivalent to what RATS calls an attestation result. And the back and forth flows on these slides match exactly what's in the RATS architecture. Yes, I agree. And it's definitely a question we should look more closely at. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background about why yep. uh, Thank you. I was not intuitively coming as the same thing. Um, and back to the queue. Uh, yep, Brendan Moran, you're next in the queue. I, I, I would just want to know whether the tokens are transferable. And if they are transfer, if they are not, how you prevent them from being transferred, and if they are transferable, um, what this is for? So the tokens are transferable, and do you mean what is the protocol for, or like what is the transferability for? I mean, the protocol um, is 
a mechanism uh, for propagating trust. So the tokens uh, are used to provide that trust. Um, the fact that they're transferable is related to the fact that they don't provide any data on how they were issued or when they were issued. Uh, sorry, maybe I, I, uh, I didn't make myself clear. Are tokens transferable from client to client? Could I copy some tokens and hand them to my friend and let him use them? So yeah, in the current the current protocol based on the VOPRF uh, that I mentioned, then yes, they can be transferred client to client. Okay, then my second question was, well, what is this protocol for? You said it was about a testing, for example, that someone is human. If I can take a bunch of I am a human tokens and hand them to a bot, then what does this get you? So I think this is a good question. Um, I think essentially, like, they're intended as a finite resource. They're not intended, you're not intended to get them on like a huge scale. Uh, I think it's a trade off between wanting to maintain privacy uh, as much as possible. I think um, looking at the use case where you would potentially link the uh, tokens to some sort of identity is something that we could consider. But um, again, uh, this, this is the outline we have so far. Okay, Martin Thompson. Uh, yeah, Martin Thompson. Um, so my question has to do with the amount of information that, the, that is propagated across the um, the transfer of information. So you talk to an an, uh, an issuer of tokens, and then you talk to a uh, another entity, presumably. Although your diagrams have often shown the one entity involved, you talk to another entity who uh, redeems the token. How much information uh, traverses this? this path and is there any intention to allow the client to add information to this um, attestation that it generates? So in in the um, in the protocol document we talk more about like so the different uh, like architectures you have for the server so like I guess you're talking about like you would redeem the client would redeem the token with someone who would then forward that on to uh, some the, the server that actually checks that. Uh, so in terms of extra information, um, I think this is something that would be uh, handled in uh, what will become the H like the HTTP API document, I think, uh, and also corresponds to like, I did, I did, I did maybe include adding metadata to the exchange, but I think um, for, na like for now the protocol works just with the cryptographic data involved. So, uh, I mean, the way I've presented it is just, is you, you would just transfer this cryptographic data across and that can be verified on its own without additional data. Okay, well, um, maybe I'll take this up later. I think this is an important question. Giorgio Nicolas, you're next. Uh, actually, I see you. Okay, uh, then Subodh Iyengar. On Facebook. Uh, I just wanted to add some to the use case that Alex mentioned in the present. Um, and uh, I think somebody brought up whether this for only only flat apps. Um, the place where we're applying this to actually at the moment is more on the apps side of things than on the web. And, uh, uh, and somebody brought up like about um, like the fraud use case, we're actually thinking of this as like an additional signal to be used when you're doing things like anonymously logging analytics or things like that. So while this will probably not be the only thing that determines whether you're human or not, this is a very high uh, signal way to determine whether you're human or not. Uh, so I think it's used in conjunction with other uh, fraud prevention mechanisms and it's not the only one to replace everything. Thanks. Daniel Migot, you're next. Yeah, so maybe Subo just answer to that, but um, it's not clear to me. Is that an, an issue token, um, let's say provided by Cloudflare, could be used um, with Facebook, for example? Uh, so Alex, um, Davidson speaking. Uh, so 
the current cryptographic uh, implementation just allows symmetric verification. So the issuing server must also be the one that verifies the token. Okay, thanks. Mariana Rekova. Hi, Mariana Rekova. Uh, I first wanted to ask a procedural question. If we want to respond to some of the previous comments, is there a more effective way to do it rather than going through the queue? Uh, in, in particular, I had the uh, answer here about the transferability. Uh, I guess this, this model uh, is more for a setting where it, it, these tokens are the possession of the client and it's kind of the responsibility of the client to uh, guard them. Uh, because they will be used by the client as this one-time use authentication token. So I think this, this protocol works in this model. That if somebody steals the token, then yeah, they, they can use it, and this is kind of entangled with the anonymous property. Like, uh, essentially, you can think of this as stealing your credential in any other anonymous authentication scheme. Right? So stealing the token is not so much about transferability, it's about uh, Thank you for the comment. Anthony Nadalin. Tony Nadalin, um, question is who do you see as issuers of these tokens, right? Because that can potentially be a big fraud issue. So do you see this as a, a registry of token issuers or how do you maintain, how do you select who can actually issue these trust tokens? Uh, yeah, uh, Alex speaking. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so this um, is going to be covered, uh, but essentially the idea that we have in mind currently is that there'll be some central authority that monitors the issuers uh, that are valid at any one time. So there will be some sort of registry of issuers that can issue these tokens uh, and they'll have to register in order to be able to do that. Um, and like public, they, they have to publish some sort of like uh, public cryptographic uh, data in order to be able to issue tokens uh, successfully. Uh, this is something that we cover in the the architecture document currently. Um, but yeah, again, Stephen will uh, touch on this in the next uh, talk. Thanks. Thanks everybody for your comments. We have drained the queue, so we can move on slightly ahead of schedule to uh, to the next. Uh, the next set of slides, uh, or the next slide. Uh, so, Joe, over to you. Okay, so let's switch gears here. And so, Stephen, if you're around, you can unmute. Yes, uh, Stephen, what is Google? I'm going to go over quickly the drafts, key management ideas, and implementations that we have so far, just as a like idea of what the current state of the ecosystem is, I guess. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So the first draft we have is the Privacy Pass Protocol draft, which is a lot like the previous presentation. It covers a lot of the cryptographic protocols, how client issuance and redemption steps actually work, and the requirements of like the underlying cryptographic protocols. Right now with VLPRF, it's possible that we extend this with other protocols, and there's the extension policy included in this draft to discuss that. And a part of the working group would be to tighten up this draft and see what sorts of extensions we would want as part of like the core protocol itself. Next draft, or next slide. The second draft that we have is the architecture draft, which goes more into the sorts of requirements on client servers and the considerations we need to worry about. Particularly, it exposes interfaces that can be used by different applications, use cases on top of privacy paths in order to call into the protocol itself. Things like how the issuer would store keys, retrieve keys, and do the actual messages that communicate with the client. Uh, a large portion of this draft is also about how key management works, which we'll discuss a few of the options, including what's currently written. The privacy considerations, since while this does limit the amount of information that can be transferred between the issuer from the issuance time to redemption, there is still at least the one bit of information that is leaked between issuance and redemption. And there's concerns about user segregation if you allow a bunch of different keys for one issuer uh, and other forms of tracking and identity leakage. 
And as we clean up this document, we'll need to discuss more about the privacy trade-offs that are necessary to support having these like key rotations, even though uh, having additional keys might allow you to do additional bits of data leakage. There are also security considerations in a malicious client might ask for 500 privacy pass tokens, and then on a malicious website or malicious endpoint, it would redeem all of them, forcing the client to lose all their tokens immediately. We also discuss extension policies on the wider architecture side of things, how other applications would build on top of this, instead of how in the previous draft, it's mostly about the core protocol itself. Next slide. As an example, one of the drafts we have initially is the HTTP API draft, which talks about how to build on top of the previous architecture draft for a HTTP use case. It currently talks about the wrappings that you would use to send protocol messages over uh, HTTP headers, um, the sorts of key management requirements that HTTP clients, notably browsers and websites that use these APIs, would have to abide by. Um, and there's a example of a potential extension called delegated redemption, which is a way for, at least in the web ecosystem world, the ability to give in a trust, uh, privacy pass redemption, send it around to other parties without leaking any information. That way, every website isn't talking to the issuer every single time. Um, and the extent of how much we want in this HTTP API doc is also a thing that we need to discuss as a working group, see what is valuable here. There's a interaction between this and W3C in terms of also kind of an HTTP API, the sorts of like JavaScript APIs, fetch APIs you might need to support the use of privacy paths in the web ecosystem. And some of that might need to be discussed here and other parts may need to be a liaison with the W3C. Uh, next slide. So before oh. we, hi, this is Ben Schwartz. Before we go on, I just uh, wanna ask if there are any questions about the drafts uh, before we move on to talk specifically about key management. Hearing no plus cues, we'll move forward to talk about key management options. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next slide. So one of the big things that need to be determined for privacy pass is how issuers manage their keys. In an optimal world, an issuer would have a single key that they use to sign every single privacy pass token. And that means that that one key is the one that's always used. Unfortunately, we're not in an ideal world, so we need to support key rotation in case an issuer loses their keys or their keys are compromised. But we need to balance that with the problem that multiple keys being in use can allow for user segregation. Or even on Friday, the issuer may sign privacy pass tokens for one bit of information. On Tuesday, they use a different key to sign for a different bit of information. And we also need to somehow have a way that you can audit that a privacy pass issuer hasn't been changing their keys and presenting different keys to different users. Next slide. So there's a couple of options to do key management here. The first one is that clients would just get their keys directly from the issuer. Um, they'd have to get these keys through some sort of anonymous connection so that the issuer is not like determining that you're user A and giving you the key commitments for user A. Uh, you'd need some sort of auditor to try keeping track of if an issuer is presenting different viewpoints to different clients. And for the most part, that's only a mitigation. So directly fetching key commitments from an issuer is kind of a messy and not great from a privacy perspective option. Next. The second option is having some sort of trusted proxy that is responsible for doing this fetching of key configurations. Uh, and then clients would fetch it from this proxy. Um, you would have to trust this proxy so that they're not prevent presenting different viewpoints of the world. But if you do have some sort of trusted party, be it your UA or a uh, third party like university that is doing all the fetching and then storing of the key commitments locally, you wouldn't have to be worried about the issuer itself presenting different key commitments. Um, next. next slide. 
Uh, the third option, and the one we currently have written in the HTTP API document, is a commitment registry, some sort of append-only log, where all issuers would append their key commitments to this log, and all clients would be fetching the key commitments, either from this log or from the issuer directly, as long as the issuer presented some sort of inclusion proof. This does require a slightly bigger ecosystem where you have this sort of append-only log, but it does allow for a cryptographically assured assurance that this key commitment has been reported to this log. Auditors could then keep track of what key commitments have been reported and take note of their re rotating key commitments too frequently. Clients could have policy for the rate of key rotation allowed. Uh, and the log itself could just say that if you're receiving a new key commitment every five minutes, then that's probably not a valid key rotation policy. It, we need to figure out what some recommended policies would be for like how often an issuer would be allowed to rotate their keys. Next slide. So throughout all the documents, there's a number of open questions. These are a few of them. There's the issue of malicious clients getting tokens and then spending them multiple times in the case that an issuer has different endpoints. You need some sort of eventual consistency, otherwise a single token can be reading five times for the five different data centers an issuer might be running. Uh, another problem is how a client and the ecosystem as a whole would be detecting malicious servers. You, clients would need to have some way to talk with other clients to say that they've seen a different viewpoint of what the key has, what keys the issuer has presented. This is somewhat solved if you do something like a log approach to key management, but if you do a simpler approach, which is just the issuer gives you keys directly, you need some sort of way to determine that the issuer has been acting poorly. There's the question of key rotation windows, the balance between how often you want to rotate for security versus the privacy implications for rotating your keys too frequently. And then there's the question of if you allow 5 million issuers, then you get 5 million different tokens and each of those represent one bit. So there are some privacy considerations for having a massive collection of issuers, but you also want to avoid consolidation and limiting problems with limiting the number of issuers that exist in the ecosystem. There's possible solutions for this where instead of limiting the number of issuers, you might limit the number of redemptions that a particular site or endpoint would do at a time. But these are considerations and open questions we need to go over. Uh, next slide. And then in terms of current implementations and APIs that exist, Cloudflare has their Go JavaScript Challenge Bypass extension, which was one of the original reasons behind Privacy Pass. Brave has a Rust JavaScript implementation for their bats that Alex mentioned earlier. And Chrome is beginning to implement a variant of this for HTTP based on the HTTP API in C and JavaScript. Um, next slide. Or I guess that's like last slide. Ben Schwartz here. Uh, Joe, could you go back to the open question slide? Thank you. Uh, ben Kadek, you're up. Hi, Ben Kadek here. I just want to clarify for the detection of malicious servers, is that to detect malicious token issuers or uh, token consumers? Or uh, this, this would be mostly for token issuers. If a token issuer and a token redeemer were two different parties, you'd also want to detect that. Though I think the issuance is the more interesting problem here, since at issuance time is when the issuer has information about the user. Right. Thanks. Subodh so Iyengar, you're up. Subodh Iyengar. Um, the for the double spending um, argue, um, kind of uh, um, system, uh, do all application profiles need uh, perfect double spending kind of protection or it seems like it seems like we have uh, a variety of different applications, and as we kind of standardize this thing, we'll have more and more new applications. And like, it doesn't seem like every single application might need a double spending kind of strict double spending uh, um, kind of requirement. Do you see that Privacy Pass is actually going to be relaxed at depending on application profile, or we're going to put double spending as a hard hard requirement? I think there's a lot of use cases that won't need this double spending requirement. I think it would be useful to detail like how you would maintain this double spending or what the cost of not having this double spending protection is. 
in terms of like a single token can then be turned into n different tokens. I don't think we need to like require all applications to be double spending secure. Sounds good. Richard Barnes, uh, your turn. Hi, uh, this is Richard Barnes. Uh, I just wanted to raise the question of whether this part of the work, of how critical this part of the work is. It seems like the whole point of this work is that the issuer uh, or the sites using privacy pass are trying to do better than uh, earlier privacy, more privacy hostile mechanisms. Um, and so it seems like if you had a malicious issuer, they could just revert back to using the other, you know, the older, more privacy hostile mechanisms. Um, you know, assuming that no one's going to say, you know, require privacy pass. Um, so I, I think it would be good to understand kind of what that context is, kind of what we're assuming um, the, the various entities' capabilities are, because uh, I, I kind of suspect that um, if we're going to be in a situation that, that many of the practical situations where this could get applied will have that property that, you know, if the, the issuer were, were malicious, then they could simply not do this protocol and achieve um, whatever the objective is. I think there's some... Uh, or... Sorry, go ahead. I think there's some hope that like alone this protocol is fairly privacy tight. It's true that a lot of issuers could just not do this protocol and revert to other less privacy positive means of transferring information. So I know some browsers have been working on reducing the like privacy negative abilities of malicious actors. Yeah. And, and I, I, just to be clear in terms of kind of deliverables for this work, I, I, th I think I would be tempted to view it as acceptable to simply clearly describe the privacy properties of the protocol itself um, and kind of deliver a, an initial protocol with just a clear description, even if there are some of these, some of these questions remain unaddressed in the first version. I think even it may I think it's still valuable to yeah at least like talk about what these privacy issues is even if we can't like completely solve them but I think it's worth attempting to solve at least the ones we can with the protocol itself and I guess that's the somewhat of the split between the core protocol doc and the architecture doc yeah just just conscious of keeping scope achievable here Dave Thaler and I think we'll close the queue here. Yeah, this is Dave. Uh, so I'd ask this question in the uh, Jabber room, and I haven't gotten an answer that I understand yet, so I'll ask it here. Um, why is uh, double spend an issue? I understand why your token might want to have some notion of an expiration time, but how does it matter, or why does it matter how many uses it has before it expires? So for some use cases, it's possible that the issuer like knows that this user has been active on this website for like two weeks and only wants to give them like 12 tokens because like a user that has been active for that long, that's how much they trust that user. If you allow double spend, then that means one token can just be sent to like 5 million malicious people. So like if you have one human, they could do this whole transferring thing of copying their tokens and giving it to all their bots and then their bots could use up these tokens. So, so like, you only partly answered my question because you start off saying, well, let's assume that you only want to give out 12 uses. That's the part that I'm questioning. Why is it you'd only want to give out 12 uses, which might take, you know, 12 milliseconds, might last for 12 milliseconds, or it might last for 12 months? Why would you not say you can use it for the next 12 minutes, regardless of whether it's 12 attempts, 20 attempts, or one attempt within that 12 minutes? Uh, this partially goes back to the transferability question, and uh, these tokens aren't bound to a specific user. So if there's a malicious user that is able to get one token, you don't want that one token to be used arbitrarily many times across arbitrarily many clients. So the issuer wants to choose some number of tokens that they give out that they're willing to pay the trade-off of. They may be passed on to bots or other malicious actors. Okay, so you're saying it's a uh, workaround for not being able to solve the transferability problem. It's not a great workaround, but it's the best you have is what I'm gathering. Uh, Partially, yeah. I mean, there's also the a user who's been on your website for a long time, you're willing to give them more tokens or maybe more longer lasting tokens. So yeah, so, that's what I'm asking is, is yeah. I, I completely agree with having, you know, how long this stuff is valid for, but I was really, my question was, why does the number of uses within that time matter? And you're saying it's the closest thing you have to a mitigation against transferability. And also, if you want a longer time span for the token to be valid, we don't have a mechanism for 
changing that expiration date that's not privacy leaking. So giving them more tokens that they can use for longer, I guess, is also a way to transfer that, like having a longer expiration time. Can I just jump in here as well, Alex Davidson? So also the client may not want to use the same token over and over again because that will leak. And it will link all the sessions together that it uses that token in. So it's in their best interest in some cases to be issued a finer number of tokens and they can use each of those without uh, the server being able to link each one. Yeah. Well, I understand that, but that can be done by issuing one token per session or something that the client wants. If the client wants to preserve its not anonymity, you can always ask for more tokens, one per session, or use it within a session. I think there are other solutions to that. I think the main answer is what we what I heard before. So, uh, we, we can go on. Okay, uh, we're gonna we're gonna move on here. Um, the the next question is from Mariana Rekova. Um, so I, it was again a comment uh, about the scope. Um, I think somebody mentioned that maybe it would be good to have the protocol specified and, and probably postpone these discussions on the different security issues. So I just wanted to mention that there is a protocol, the privacy pass protocol satisfies many of these properties. So I think the purpose of this working group should really kind of go beyond uh, this set of properties already achieved by privacy pass and look into uh, what po possible extensions would bring up as additional issues. Yeah, I think, I guess, the, the core point of the working group is to make the privacy protocol a real protocol, given that as part of like the ITF, but I do think it is valuable to maybe scope a little bit beyond that, since otherwise it's limited to taking the existing draft and publishing it. And I think there's a lot of more interesting work in the space, the architecture that is worth pursuing. But I guess that's a question for the BOF and the working group as a whole. Hopefully the charter discussion will help us nail down exactly what extent we want the working group. Giorgio Nicolas. Hello, Giorgio Nicolas. A small question. Is it possible to generate a new token from a current token or do I have to run the algorithm all over again, protocol all over again when my token expires? Uh, so it's not possible to generate a new token from an existing token. This is somewhat intentional and to prevent like one token from being turned into thousands. It's possible that uh, things built on top of privacy pass, the HTTP API maybe, would allow you to submit a token to then get a new batch of tokens from the issuer. But in general, you'd have to do the whole protocol again if you want more tokens. All right, thank you. And Ben Kadak. Uh, hi, Ben Kadak here. I just want to get back to Dave Thaler's point and sort of comment that there seems to be a pretty fundamental um, opposition between having the unlinkable property and the transferable property. Uh, so like one of the goals is that the token uh, use is not linkable to the token issuance event and it seems kind of inherent or intuitive to me that this sort of implies that your token is going to be transferable and not tied to one single client uh, and because of that sort of fundamental uh, incompatibility between unlinkability and, and the ability to transfer the token, I think that's why it is so fundamental that we have to consider the double spend protection, even if it's not a fully robust double spend protection, but some level of multiple spend protection. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we've cleared the queue, so we can move on to the next segment. Joe? Okay, I, I think before we go into charter, I, I'd like to make sure that uh, people have a chance to let us know if if they're still, you know, kind of unclear about the the problem and and use cases uh, that have been presented here. So if you if you still have, you know, big questions about that, um, now would be the time to ask those. All right, so it seems like uh, folks are 
fairly uh, comfortable with their understanding of the problem in use cases. Ben um, Kadok? Uh, ben, did you? Yeah. I mean, I, this is Ben Kadok again. I just wanted to note that the Jabber room is still pretty active with people who okay. maybe are not super uh, in agreement on, on the use cases yet. And uh, if I'm reading the Jabber room correctly, I would encourage some, a few people to, to get in the queue here. For the next hour or two, we'll start in an hour. Okay, Martin Thompson. And I call you Cullen Jennings, can you mute, please? Uh, Oh, he's not listening anyway. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so um, one of the things that I've not gotten from the discussion thus far, and I think it's part of the problem that people in the in the chat are having as well, is the relationship between the different actors in this situation and how much trust each one is required to confer on the others with respect to um, what their motives are and incentives and, and that sort of thing. So as a client, how much do I rely on the, on the fact that the issuer is um, not playing hooky? So we have um, in Steve's thing, the, the transparency thing that um, sort of covered off the, the question of issuers having multiple keys. But we also have the potential if the issuer and the, the party that redeems the, the token in the end being different parties, the redeeming party could have multiple issuers and use the selection of issuer to also segregate clients. And so I'd like a little bit more clarity about um, what the goals are with respect to that. I think part of this is the client is going to need to have some policy in allowing only like a website or a party that is requesting a token to be issued to like pre-commit to what issuer they want to use. Like I don't think we can support a case where like you choose an issuer after you know the user's identity because otherwise I have 50 different issuers for like 50 different users. Um, and part of the idea of having like a registry of the issuers that are registered is that you don't have the ability to spin up a brand new issuer as a, issu as a client attempts to get a token. So the client for the most part has to trust that the list of issuers is reasonable, but otherwise doesn't need to trust that a particular issuer is presenting different like identities to them. I guess similarly. Right. And so that, that question is central to the to all of this. And um, I'm I'm comfortable with this proceeding on the grounds that this is this is um, a detail that needs to be worked out. But I want to highlight the importance of it, that's all. Yeah, I think this is definitely one of the big questions that needs to be worked out in the architecture and the protocol specific or the application specific documents. Okay, uh, Joe, back to you. Um, I think we have a couple other folks in the queue. I think Roman. Nope, nope, queue is clear. Nope. Oh, the queue is clear, okay. Um, so hopefully uh, we have, uh, people have a, pretty decent understanding of the underlying uh, uh, underlying problem space. Um, question now is, is this a problem space that, do, do people feel that this is not something that, that should be a topic for the IETF? Reasons why we shouldn't do this here. So I think, uh, Nick, are you in the queue? Yep, Nick Doty. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to check. This is Nick Doty. Um, uh, in terms of sh should we work on this? Like, do, do we have a sense of uh, uh, diversity of interested implementers? As, as, a, as a user, as a privacy advocate, I think there's a lot of value to this. I would be happy to provide reviews. If it's just going to be a couple of the largest companies that are going to implement it, then it might not need as much standardization work. So maybe Alex and uh, Stephen, you can provide some information on who's. Yeah, so um, 
uh, Alex speaking. Uh, so I think we, so as I mentioned in, uh, in the presentation before, like we have a number of applications that are currently being used. So, um, and we intend to keep exploring them uh, and introducing new applications as well. But equally, we're also looking for uh, wider participation from the community. Um, uh, as you mentioned, like uh, like the current the current applications are limited to a, a few uh, organisations and institutions. But um, like it would obviously be preferable for us as well for, to in, introduce more diversity to that process. Um, Eli, could you please state your full name? Yeah, so this is Eli Kadori from Intuition Machines. We actually have a service called HCAPTCHA, which is uh, one of the current users of privacy class as well. We're using it for more or less a standard uh, you know, accessibility use case. And so we're not one of the largest companies on the internet, but I think we are quite interested in you know, privacy and there are certainly others out there like us. I would expect there to be more adoption as the standards process continues and people become more aware of the options. Thank you, Eli. Dave Thaler. Uh, Dave Thaler, uh, just wanted to comment on the overall question, should the IETF work on this? I interpret that question as should the IETF work on this problem as opposed to this particular solution or whatever, and so on the should it work on this problem? I think the answer is yes. Um, I think it should have a a close relationship with rats, but um, I don't know of a better place to do this work, and I've not heard somebody else bring up a better place to do this work, and I think it's an interesting problem. Um, I'm not yet convinced that the, you know, I can't tell yet whether the solution is in the right direction or not. I don't have enough information, uh, for example. Um, I think it would be useful for the IETF to, or the IRTF, I'm not sure, or both, to look at the question of can you get um, non-transferability and anonymity in the same algorithm? If so, that would be a better thing to build the solution on top of. You still need protocol work either way. And so overall, the answer is yes, but that's what I would want to keep in mind. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. DKG? Hi there. This is Daniel Kongil, ACLU. Um, I do think the IETF should work on this. Um, the, I, I the concerns that are in the Jabber room about the centralization impacts, uh, but there is a lot of central that is already happening and I do value to kind of if we don't uh, have a bunch of folks talking about how it DKG, works. And a bunch of DKG, I'm having trouble hearing you. It seems like there might be an audio uh, issue. So uh, to make sure that we get all of your comments, uh, I'd encourage you to put them in text too. I'll put them in the Jabber room. But I do think the IETF should work on this. Tommy Polly, you're up. Hi, um, this is Tommy Polly from Apple. Um, I just want to say that we are also very interested in this general problem space, and I think that this is something that the IETF should work on. Similar to the other comments, um, the specific problem um, solution space that's been explored, I think, is a good starting point, but not necessarily um, where things need to land. But uh, the conversation that we're having here, I think, is the right conversation to start from, and I'd like to see this go forward. Thank you, Tommy. Watson Ladd? Watson, I'm from Cloudflare. In fact, I'm a coworker of Alex's. Um, I think this is something the ITF should work on. I'd just like to clarify that this is solving a very different problem than RATS. It's, or, or you prove is the other system that came out of Microsoft Research that, that one would look at. Um, this is really about anonymity. The goal here is to be able to issue a token and redeem it later without being able to link those two transactions. And the token is not really carrying any information beyond its existence, like a coin. It doesn't matter which penny you gave me. You gave me a penny to get admission. Um, so I don't think it makes sense to put it in RATS, which is really focused, which is not really concerned yet with anonymity and wants to express a much richer attribute space. It's a very different problem. Thank you, Watson. Wendy Seltzer. 
Seltzer W3C as evidenced by the Q plus rather than plus Q uh, convention. Um, and uh, I also uh, think this is a good area for uh, IATF to, to work. And uh, from the W3C side, um, we've both seen some interest and um, are uh, happy to coordinate on the interactions with uh, web APIs. Subod? Subod um, yeah, we're, I think that ITF should work on this. Um, we showed our interest in this by kind of uh, having um, some private implementations of these. So like it's closed source at the moment, but uh, we also have some implementations of these as well. I'm excited to see the uh, an ecosystem evolving around this as a result of like the ITF process and standardizing it. And that's like more and more use cases as uh, as we go through this process. And that's why I think that the idea should predominantly work in this. It's not like uh, only if it's a requirement of a few big companies. All. Thank you, Andy, Natalin, Natalin. Yes, Tony Natalin. Um, I believe this is something that the IETF should work on. I do have a concern over the sign redemption records that come back possibly being used as a, a form of authentication, you know, if these records wind up getting cached and things like that. So I do think there has to be a little bit more security considerations thought into, into this protocol. Thank you. Uh, last call for responses to this slide. Joe, back to you. Okay, so I think, you know, it seems there's general uh, feeling is, is consensus is that the ITF should work on this. Um, I'd like to try to see if we can get a feeling for uh, who would be interested in contributing an effort, either as a reviewer or contributing text or, or implementing, uh, just to get an idea what we did in a, seen in some of the previous uh, BOFs is to use the chat window to put a plus one if you were uh, willing to uh, contribute some effort towards uh, this problem, either reviewing or contributing. Okay, so there's a, a fair amount of interest. It's not completely clear how much of it is uh, willing to review versus author or write text. Um, that might be a... All right. I think uh, what the, kind of the next steps would be to go through charter and, and make sure that we have an understanding of, of the scope, because I think that's the next sort of thing we would need to do is uh, uh, get to a point where, where we have some agreement on how we would move forward. So Alex, I think we can go can present about Charter. Sure. Uh, cool. Ready to go? Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for all your questions and comments. It's been really helpful. Uh, I'm just going to present a few slides that will introduce um, some of the key points in the charter, and then I think we're going to move to GitHub and we'll go through it line by line from there. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Cool. <laughs> Hyperlink. Got, got ahead of myself, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 
Yeah, so the charter that we currently have lives on GitHub. It, I've, it's, I've also posted it to the mailing list, so you can read it there if you prefer. Um, this version of the charter was previously discussed and written uh, mostly at a side meeting that took place in January. Um, we're in accordance with a number of individuals. Uh, and yeah, so next. So the main the main goals of the charter, um, as I mentioned before, so is to is to develop a protocol in the internet uh, for the internet and uh, web context, uh, along with the APIs and surrounding architecture for redeeming um, a set of unforgeable tokens. And these tokens should attest to the validity or ownership of some attribute being held by a client. And uh, as a second key property, the tokens are cryptographically unlinkable um, to pres preserve the client's privacy. And just on this point, um, we've had some good feedback about uh, how this interacts with transferability and whether these um, whether these two concepts uh, are possible to align. Uh, and this this might be something as well to consider uh, in the chart as well. Maybe just as a discussion point in the documents. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so the scope of the working group. Uh, as we'll see, is the three core documents that Stephen laid out. So we have the protocol document, which essentially describes the one-to-one -one, um, ex message exchange between a client and a server, uh, and the API that's required and the implementation of that API based on the crypto uh, cryptographic uh, implementation that we use. There's the architecture document, which lays out the wider ecosystem that we could construct around that protocol. Uh, with the clients and servers that interact together in that ecosystem and how key management um, works and the analysis of the security and privacy concerns around that. And then the uh, HTTP integration, uh, which Stephen uh, touched upon, may be something that we coordinate with W3C further down the line. Um, I think currently we're thinking that we'll write these documents to get a version of them and then uh, coordinate with W3C after, but maybe it would be good to liaise from an earlier point um, and then the other commitments in terms of the scope are to obviously the, provide a detailed and concrete analysis of the security and privacy impact um, from using this protocol uh, so that we can properly uh, calculate the privacy budget al allowed to each client as this is the main concern of the protocol and then a commitment to develop interoperable implementations which can then be used to instantiate this ecosystem um, and as someone brought up in the previous round of questions, like uh, the scope of this working group is is focused on the web context, but these implementations may well be may well be something that you could use outside of that. But that's not in scope of the working group. Uh, so next slide, please. So before uh, before we jump into the charter, some of the open questions that I just want to raise. Um, so the milestones uh, for the group are essentially going to be these core, the three core documents. Um, uh, we currently don't have any exact timeframes for those, but maybe this is something that we'd want to agree uh, either now or, or on the mailing list afterwards. Uh, and in terms of those milestones, there may also be extensions that uh, we might want to uh, coordinate and uh, deciding a policy on accepting those extensions might be something that we want in the charter uh, in, in terms of how the working group would review and uh, edit and accept those extensions. And obviously, if there's any other uh, feedback, uh, that would be really useful uh, for us. Uh, so I think I'm at the end of my slides. So if there's, if there's any questions before I want to jump in, uh, please do ask them. Yep. Ben Kadak, you're up. Hi, this is Ben Kedok. If you could go back one slide. Uh, so I have two questions, uh, and I think we can answer them separately. So the first question was relating to sort of the milestones. And I think on the last slide, you had mentioned that you are seeing these existing three documents as being sort of key milestones for the group. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted to sort of ask how, how strongly we really are tied to that breakdown as opposed to uh, potential other ways to divvy up the work in this space, uh, and also to ask whether the you know, security and privacy analysis would be you know, bundled into those three documents or a separate milestone. Uh, obviously, it would be uh, a deliverable of the group regardless. So 
how, how, how strongly tied are you to those three doc, existing documents as the milestones? Uh, good question. So I think it's essentially those core documents were decided in the previous uh, meeting, but um, so we're, we're current, that's what we've currently gone for. But it, in terms of what we're actually tied down to, like the, these, uh, this, like these milestones are malleable in a sense. If people think that some of this work could be incorporated into um, a different, into it, well, condensed into fewer documents or made out into more documents, then that's something uh, we can definitely discuss, and maybe that's and maybe that would be the best thing to go forward. Um, and then in terms of the security and privacy concerns, I these are things. So I've highlighted them here as they. I think I believe they're very important to the. Um, instantiation of the, of the ecosystem, but they're things that are covered in the architecture document specifically. Very good. Uh, and then for my second question, I think, can we go back one further slide? Uh, we were talking about how the issuer is um, sort of providing the, the validity of some attribute being held by a client. Uh, and I was sort of wondering if we see it as pretty fundamental that any single token gives indication of one single attribute and as this has a corollary that any single issuer only issues tokens about that single attribute. I know we've talked about sort of the is a human attribute a lot for the capture like use cases. And there was a little bit about the, the brave browsers. I think it was the bats token that is sort of one unit of currency in some sense. Uh, do we think it's pretty fundamental to have the, the single attribute, single issuer uh, per token relationship? So I, I, this is maybe something that Stephen may also want to comment on. But I think um, personally, the the um, it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the issuer's key and the attribute that's being considered, in the sense that the, the, any one issuer should only be checking for that attribute and that key should and the key they use essentially corresponds to whether that attribute is owned or not. Uh, so. Yeah, that's how I was picturing it in my head, but I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page. Okay, Martin Thompson. Martin Thompson, uh, we are not all on the same page, I suspect. Um, I understand that this is a, a property of the system as described to us, the one, the one that we have an existence proof for. But I don't think this is a necessary property of a system of this shape, necessarily. Um, and so, um, I'm aware of techniques such as those in DigiCash where clients and servers, or sorry, clients and issuers can agree on information that is um, that carries across with tokens. And that potentially offers a different, different way out for, for some of these problems. When we get into saying that clients um, and servers have to be, and issuers have to have a single purpose, then we, introduce some interesting uh, privacy implications in the sense that now if the any party involved can decide on what property they want to carry across and what combination of properties they want to carry across, then um, you have lose control or could lose control over the information that's transferred across. I, I think I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I would like to see uh, a little more discussion about the relationship between the different entities involved before we get into concretely putting those those things down in the charter. I see that the, the charter that's up online doesn't explicitly list those documents. So I would like to talk through that stuff first. And um, I'm more or less okay with the charter, but um, I'm not sure about some of the specific details here. So MT, just to jump in real quick, this has been Kadok as AD. Uh, when you said that you wanted to see further discussion about sort of the relationship between the entities, would you be proposing that we specifically charter just to do that discussion and plan to recharter before taking on the specific uh, protocol or, or API bindings work? Uh, probably more along the lines of specifically set out to to address those those questions first before talking about adoption of any documents. Okay, the presentation so like here suggested that those documents were essentially it, whereas I, I think we have a little more flexibility in terms of where, where the, the group ends up. Sure, so you're seeing like an initial milestone that is to perform this investigation and then we can still have yeah. other milestones, great. 
or add those milestones as it comes along. Yep. Yes. Andrew Campley. Sorry, can I just jump? Uh, I, I I agree with Martin's point. I think that that is something that we can do in in the charter. We can modify the milestones to do that, and I think that could be a good idea. I thank you. Uh, looking at the next slide, I think it was. Um, so your slide four. Um, the yes, that's it. The, will the uh, analysis of security and privacy concerns will that uh, include consideration of the potential for centralisation? So um, just to clarify, centralisation in the sense that all the issues coalesce around the single entity. Yes, or small, very small number of entities. Yes, um, that is not something that we currently consider. Um, I think uh, I I appreciate the point. I think that is something that could that could be a problem going forward. I think one of the things, uh, well, one of the open questions that we have is kind of how this ecosystem is developed, and and there are maybe the way we construct it currently is not how it would. Uh, continue, but um, I think partially that will depend on on what interest we see, and and uh, but e equally, I think I, I agree the centralisation is an issue, and and if it turns out that it looks like we will only have a smaller number of issues, and they will come from all essentially the same few entities, then I think that is something we should uh, we should analyse. Yeah, I agree. It should. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've finished the queue. So Joe, back to you. Okay, so we have, uh, there's been, I see some discussion of charter uh, in the uh, uh, Jabber, but um, I guess it would be good to kind of go through some of the specific uh, text and places where people have questions or think the charter should be improved. Uh, let's see. So we have, I think I see Dave in the Dave Taylor in the queue. Um, yeah. So this is Dave. I have a couple of points. I may only cover some of them right now and wait until you uh, get down to other parts. But uh, since you opened it up here, just to repeat some of the previous ones. Like uh, I think part of the question is whether the charter uh, should constrain the work to talk about the case where the information is about human test versus some other attribute. Currently, the first line implies the answer is yes. If that is the intent, then uh, that sentence is good. If you want to widen it, that sentence is bad. Um, the second half of that is whether it should be constrained to just a web context or not. And the only place that constrains it to a web context right now is down just a little bit when it talks about the, uh, the uh, API or whatever. Um, I think and I did a search. Yeah, uh, right there, right up right below uh, the cursor where it says responses for web-based applications. And so right now the, the document for one in ACP is web-based, but the rest of the work is not web-based. And so I don't know whether that's the intent here. So right now it looks like the entire intent is to scope it to human, but only that one particular item is meant to scope it to a web. And I don't know if that was what was desired. Alex or Steven? Uh, Alex, uh, Alex speaking. So I think um, this is potentially just an issue of the text, but I think I, I agree with your point about human. I think we could probably extend beyond human to client. Um, there was a reason that we chose the word human initially that I can't remember. So maybe if, if someone wants to jump in and remind me of that. But I think um, it said the crucial thing here is that we're scoping to the web context. Um, okay, then. Uh, so there you're saying the entire thing should be scoped to a web context, not just point number three. And so that's not clear in the existing text at all. Um, uh, so in other words, like the very first paragraph or something like that may need to be updated to talk about it, to, to scope it specifically down to the web context. I, I agree with the notion of, hey, let's scope stuff as narrowly as uh, makes sense to fit the current demands and things. And so saying that this one is scoped to the web is okay with me. Um, once you broaden that past human, 
then uh, the questions about relationship to rats comes up. And so under the first sub-bullet of point one, it talks about specify the full cryptographic authorization exchange and terminology. Um, since you're talking about terminology and often the term attestation came up, then there's going to be terminology relationship issues, even if the protocol doesn't overlap. And so I think at least the terminology work needs to specifically say it will coordinate or align or be consistent or get review with rats or something like that, depending on what we think. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Christian, please state your full name. Christian Wittema. Yeah, I, I, I very much like this work, this kind of work, and say what's about the new charter. But I would really like to see a point in section two about the architecture, about centralization risk and how to prevent it. Because, I mean, the I am really concerned that uh, this has the potential, if we don't tackle the problem from the beginning, to end up with very few issuers. And so that's something that's to be part of the architecture that we want to have an ecosystem of issuers, not just one or two. Hi, Alex speaking. Sorry, I didn't catch the last bit of your point there. Uh, he said that the the consideration is that there might be only one or two issuers if we are not careful and, and don't note this in the charter. Okay. Yeah, I think um, yeah, this is. I mean, this is something that multiple, uh, multiple people now have, uh, have said, and I think I think that the concerns are valid. And I, I can see that being added as a, a specific point to point two. Um, and I think that would be valuable. Becker? Uh, three points. Um, so uh, there, there was some discussion about this in Jabber, but um, I think there needs to be some material in here about like how the, how the, I thought I said my name, Ben, but I'll say it again. Um, anyway, um, uh, there, I need to be some text in here about um, the ability of the client to verify that the size, something at the size of the enemy says they're in, right? Um, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, what happens if you use a separate key for each, uh, you know, for, for each token you issue, right? Um, so uh, I'm not saying we have to have that problem solved now, but I think that, like, I don't say this can work unless the client has a way of verifying that, um, that that is not basically being cheated by the by the server, which is presently, does not really presently be the case. Um, um, Again, the problems we solve. That's why we have a working group. Um, the um, second point, um, as MT sort of pointed out, um, this seems very oriented towards turning this one bit of information am I authenticated? Um, that's certainly a valid use case, but it seems that there are use cases where you might want to carry more information, and it would be nice to um, uh, to have a charter which contemplated that um, in some way, um, or at least didn't want to have scope. Um, the third point is um, this: uh, um, the uh, um, uh, 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 sorry, um, this, um, this, this, the penultimate paragraph says we hope to have a number of interoperable implementations of clear analysis, of security and privacy considerations. Um, I really think that a clear analysis of security and privacy considerations along with formal proof uh, really ought to be a requirement for doing any work in this space. Um, not, not, not a nice to have. Hi, Alex speaking. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, so on your first point, uh, I agree that should be in the chart. I think that maybe is something that we've missed out. Um, so currently, we do have the functionality for the client to be able to verify they are part of a certain anonymity set because they, they can verify in zero knowledge that the server has used the key it's already committed to. So that is that is something that we should include in there if it's not already specified. Um, on your second point, uh, I didn't actually catch it, but on your third point, um, uh, I agree. I think uh, that needs to be reworded. As a requirement, um, so we we do have we have a formal uh, game-based cryptographic proof of the primitives. Uh, we, we might want to go a little further, further down the line, uh, but yeah, that that should be worded as a requirement in the charter. So thank you for Great. raising that. But uh, yeah, your second point, I didn't. Yeah. Catch. Oh, my second point was that this. 
of information, namely this is authenticated. And then there's a discussion of like a bunch of clunky mechanisms for having like more than one bit by like, you know, having multiple keys. Um, but as MC pointed out, there are techniques which are known for um, carrying substantially more bits in the same kind of anonymous token. Um, and, um, you know, maybe we don't need to have those um, in, in V1, but it should be nice not have them ruled out by the design. Hey, Edgar, could I toss in a clarifying question here? It seems like, as, as some of the use cases presented described, you can, with the single bit, the single bit can, can you know, signal a, you know, a, a, a bigger bucket of attributes that you have done five things, um, and as a result of those five things, you get this token um, and can signal having done those five things later. Um, is that... Uh, sort of in the scope of what you're talking about? Are you envisioning more complex mechanisms? Well, I mean, right. I mean, so, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, it's binary coding, so you can do anything you want. But, um, you know, even like you might imagine having a token that was like, um, so, so imagine, uh, th you know, this case is like I have done a capture, right? Basically, the people have in their heads as the use case. But you might imagine, you know, this is a user which you spend between one and 10 hours on the site or 10 and 20 and 20 and 40, right? And having to carry each of those individual bit is kind of goofy. And so um, often you want to have a situation where you can carry arbitrary data, which the user is aware of, and the user signs off on, but that's carrying the token. Um, I think Martin alluded to Digicash as an example of a system which kind of had these properties. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, um, so I guess I'm just saying that, like, it would be, like, it'd be nice not to design a system that was, like, restricted to only carrying one bit. Yeah, claims. As we, as we said, it's claims. Yes, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> DKG? I don't know if it work. <clears throat> The more bits you have the protocol clarity, or your anonymity. So I AKG, we're it. still having pretty serious audio problems from you. Uh, I would suggest that you uh, that you use the the mic. I'm sorry. Um, Subod. Subod Angari. Um, I think the bits question. One of the use cases that's seen previously in the past for. Uh, for additional bits of information is more like binding public information to these tokens as well. So classically, uh, one of the use cases that is not enabled by this protocol is to bind uh, um, some public not information. So for example, like in an ad, uh, one of the use cases that we had was like uh, in an ad ecosystem, you want to be able to bind the campaign to an anonymous token so that like you can uh, that's additional um uh conference that this token was issued for this particular ad campaign um why if you you could make it work with like multiple keys per campaign attribution but it uh, it makes the ecosystem problems more complicated so i guess the question is more about like i think it while it is possible to make um single bit per thing work uh, I, maybe we could consider extensions to the protocol as well, uh, but I, th I think that shouldn't block the fundamental work around this, which is like uh, doing uh, uh, enabling that transference of one bit of information or like one bit might represent a bunch of attributes there. Okay, uh, just uh, think it, DKG in the in in Jabber says more bits means carved up anonymity, anonymity sets. Uh, yeah, so Alex uh, speaking. So um, just to jump in, I think uh, I, oh, the, the thing with the additional bits is as DKG says, it, it does carve up the anonymity set. So we'd have to be careful about how many, about what we'd want to do if we want to add uh, extra metadata to the tokens. I think I mean, it's it's conceivable that there's room in there for extra bits without completely de-anonymizing everyone. But we'd again, we'd have to. I think this is something we'd we'd have to discuss um, in the drafts and come up with some concrete parameterization for analyzing the privacy of the clients in these. Um, it, to clarify, sorry, uh, to just suppose Iyengar here to clarify what I meant was more about uh, the if the client the clients might have the ability to choose these public bits as well. So which might not carve out the anonymity set. But I, again, I don't think it should be a blocker. Mark McFadden. Uh, thanks. I, one of my concerns here is um, 
is this potential for a very narrow band of uh, issuers, right? Um, basically, these sort of almost prompting consolidation. And what I don't see in the charter is a mechanism to a mechanism to prevent that. In fact, when I think about the three documents, it certainly it doesn't seem to me like it could be a feature of the protocol document. And it's certainly not a feature of the API document. Um, so I'm I'm really puzzled um, by how the, the mechanics by which we'd prevent that from happening, because otherwise we're simply playing into the hands of consolidation, which is something that the IAB has talked to us now for years about. Um, and so I, I'm I'm sort of confused, and I'd like to hear um, how it is that the, sort of having a very very limited number of issuers could be something that we could uh, find a way to prevent. Uh, so Alex Davidson speaking. So um, Mark, uh, thanks. Uh, I think currently, um, so this is one of the open questions that Stephen wrote, raised, but essentially what we do in the wider architecture document currently is we uh, specify an append only log, which holds the, the public commitment information, which is necessary for issuers to be able to um, produce tokens. And I think I, I guess your comment comes into the centralization, uh, centralization aspect, which has been brought up um, uh, before. But essentially, I think what would have to happen is there would have to be some sort of uh, public audit mechanism uh, for auditing this uh, commitment registry and, and making sure that the clients are happy with what's going on at any one time. And I think, uh, but again, this is uh, this is definitely something that's intended for the architecture document, but is not necessarily we don't necessarily have a great answer for right now. Um, and it is it's, uh, one of the to-dos, uh, the, the official to-dos uh, that we currently have. So I think it's it's a very important point, um, and it's something that we will have to solve in order to achieve this milestone. Uh, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, that's helpful. I think the, uh, um, the, the that auditing mechanism is something that is very difficult for me to imagine uh, because I, 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 I can't think of a parallel uh, that we have uh, to a model to work from. So um, I agree with you. I think that that is a, a really thorny open problem. And it, it, it makes me, it makes me worried about the whole enterprise, but to be honest. Thanks. Mariana Rekova. Uh, Mariana Rekova, Google. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about uh, this edition of this. Um, I think whether they're public defined by the client or by the issuer, I think in both cases, there is uh, kind of partitioning of the anonymity set. Uh, and I think both of these uh, extensions are valid and interesting extensions for, for this protocol. Uh, and as Stephen mentioned, uh, once these extensions are proposed, they, they need to be analyzed as well in terms of their privacy guarantees. But I think in, in either case, you are cutting down the anonymous sets. And the question is like, how do this like map also uh, to the setting where you have uh, multiple keys being used by the uh, by the issuer? Uh, hi, Alex speaking. Um, yeah, I think I agree. I think I think this is something that we should that we should discuss in the document uh, because I think it's clear that there are there are going to be use cases that kind of want this functionality, and uh, we're gonna. And I think so. It, it is something we should consider in the in the core uh, deliverables. Um, I think it probably like it'll probably span both the protocol and the architecture documents depending on. Uh, whether it requires changes to functionality, but um, yeah, I agree. I think it's something we should do, and it's. Uh, I think it's high. It's probably closely related to the number of uh, the number of issues that we have, and also the number of rotations that they do. But um, again, it's something we can consider. Dan York, a scribe. Dan York, uh, employed by the Internet Society, but not speaking here, and in fact, not speaking for me, but for Daniel Kahn Gilmore. Consolidation is a problem and a serious one. This draft is talking about a mechanism that allows us to place some limits on consolidated information brokers.
so I, Alex speaking. Um, so I agree. Uh, I think so. It's it's clear that consolidation here is something that's missing from the charter, and it's something that we will have to consider at length in the architecture. Uh, and we and again, this com comes into sort of like auditing uh, this centralized repository of issuers which are deemed to be trusted by the clients and uh, we will need a, a good solution for that. Martin Thompson. Yeah, Martin Thompson, one of the questions that's come up in the Java chat that I thought worth relaying into audio was um, the question of what the nature of the information is that we're passing across here and, and what clients understand that information to be. So we've talked a lot about the is a human case but there's potentially a lot of other things that could be carried in this way. And it is very important, I think, for the client to have a good understanding of what information is being carried here. And also then that comes to the question of how, the, how um, in, in a lot of cases, users will make the decision to, to authorize that transfer. Um, Stephen Farrell points out that so, is the browser going to make this decision for users? Um, and when you talk about things um, beyond the is a human, um, which is something that maybe a browser might assume someone um, using a browser is willing to, to advertise, um, it gets a little tricky. And um, knowing what that information is so that you can make a decision about whether to propagate it is, is something that I, I think we becomes very difficult to, to reason about. Now, whether the protocol needs to um, transfer that information or not is something that we should debate. Uh, uh, Alex Davidson, so you can say thank you for that point. I think uh, that, uh, that is an interesting point to bring up. I think, um, so we're, I mean, the third document, the HTTP document is essentially uh, with the aim of laying out an API that would be uh, natively uh, available in browsers. And I think um, you raise an interesting point about wh whether the browser or the human or whatever is, is making the decision on who to trust. I think, um, yeah, that's not necessarily something I've considered, but I, I could see the value in doing that. And I think maybe what we go forward from a practical perspective is maybe the browser would offer the human the chance to unsubscribe from certain issuers if they didn't feel like it, if they if they felt like that. Um, I, but, I don't think I don't think asking for forgiveness is is really the right um, the right approach to take in this case. I think it's just a, a question that we need to need to think about a lot more. It's it's not only um, who is issuing, at, but it it is what for and the scope of the information that's being transferred. And um, I just see Wendy's pointed out um, P3P again. Uh, we talked about P3P once already this week, um, and I would not like to be talking about that again. Yeah, I think I think that point I think is something we we, we can definitely um, we should definitely incorporate into at least the discussion in the document, or and maybe even further into the charter. Okay, uh, we have uh, 20 minutes remaining in the time, but uh, we have cleared the queue back to Joe for, uh, for, for the last steps. Yeah, so uh, it seems like we've had a, a decent discussion on the charter and there's definitely work to be done. Um, I encourage uh, people to join the privacy pass list so we can work on that. Uh, in between, uh, well, after this meeting is done. Um, I guess a uh, question for, for Ben and, and Roman, uh, are there things that you would like to see uh, from this uh, meeting that would, would help you, questions that we haven't asked, um, or information that you feel would be necessary? Uh, so I don't think that there's a whole lot more I would like to get out of this meeting specifically. I think we've already gotten quite a bit of value. We have uh, a large body of interest in this topic and we've sort of 
agreed upon several areas or topics that we want to get further discussion on and further text into the charter. So my expectation of the next steps would be to have the probably the proponents put together like a first rough cut of how to integrate the feedback we got today into the charter and then we can continue the discussion on the mailing list as to you know, whether those proposed charter edits are addressing all of the topics that we brought up. Sounds good. All right, did uh, Dave just add himself to the queue? Uh, yes, one last question when talking about the scoping is because a lot of the discussion has been around uh, the notion of uh, uh, transferability or the lack thereof or non-transferability of the lack thereof. Um, and so the question is really, should the charter scope this to scope this discussion to say to, to assuming that uh, transferability cannot be prevented? Should it say that such work should be investigated by this working group or should it say nothing and just leave that to the discussion of the architecture that's done by the working group? I see uh, uh, two people jump in with answers, maybe. We'll see. Uh, yeah. Uh, did, or So if Alex or Stephen had a comment there, they can jump in. Otherwise, we'll keep going. Uh, so I, Alex, can, can you just repeat the point that I just uh, I missed? So for example, the current proposed protocol is designed in a way that uh, uh, assumes that transferability cannot be prevented. Okay, and so the question is, should the should the charter scope the working group to work on cases um, that uh, are designed for cases where transferability cannot be prevented, or B, should it say that uh, the working group will also discuss any other ways to uh, deal with um, preventing transferability? Or should it say nothing and leave that discussion to the actual work inside of, say, the architecture document? So uh, my personal feeling is maybe that um, I think transferability is definitely something that we have to discuss. I don't necessarily think it belongs in the charter, but maybe what we could say is something like we we uh, the tokens must be unlinkable uh, with some provisos based on uh, additional metadata. I mean, it, it depends on the sort of mechanisms that uh, if if there are future mechanisms dis uh, investigated and discussed that may make transferability. Um, not possible and something we might want to add, then I think uh, that would be valuable. But I think it might belong more in the in the documentation rather than as a charted goal. Uh, okay, Roman. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, I think people might have different feelings depending on how exactly something like that would get dropped in the charter. I, I think it's I think it's worth talking about how that's going to be an assumption in subsequent documents. So to be clear, are you proposing that this should go in the charter? Yeah, I'm proposing that we need to put something in the charter about it uh, and not wait for decision time later in documents, because I think it's going to be a cross-cutting cross -cutting assumption across all of the documents. Okay. I think we, I don't know what the right answer is, but I, and we need to kind of talk about it, but I think we're going to need to document the conclusion of that discussion in the charter. Uh, so do you think we need to conclude that discussion before chartering? Or can we pose the question in the charter as work for the group? Uh, that's a good question. I think we should... I mean, it honestly comes down to what the group is going to be comfortable with, with that level of ambiguity. I think we minimally need to pose it in the charter. Thank you. Uh, uh, so the, the next the next commenter uh, is either Stu C or Adam W. Could you please state your name? Yeah, so this is Stu Card here sitting with Adam Whitaker. Um, so the, the issue of uh, non-transferability relates to the nature of the authorization. One of the slides said that the, the first goal was for the token to show that the client holds a certain attribute. And I want to draw a distinction between two subtly different things. 
the client having an attribute and the token attesting to that fact is completely different from the client having a right that the issuer granted him because at some time he proved that he held some attribute. If the token represents the right granted by the issuer because the client proved that at some point in time he had this attribute, then it doesn't need to be non-transferable. Transferability is no problem. But if the token supposedly represents that the holder of the token actually still now is the same guy that at some point in the past held that attribute, then by God, it had better be non-transferable. So I don't care which way that's handled in the charter, whether you draw that subtle distinction there, or if you say that non-transferability needs to be in there, but somehow that's got to be addressed. Thank you. Richard Barnes. Hey, I was going to touch on this question of transferability. And I actually think Alex was, was about on the right note to flag this as an issue for study and, and that we should try and get some precision on. But I, I don't think I, I would be comfortable at this stage putting some real hard requirements uh, in the charter around this. Um, it's not immediately clear to me, admittedly not having studied this real deeply, that um, you know the available mechanisms for achieving various non-transferability properties are actually compatible with the privacy goals of this protocol. So I, I think that this is definitely something that's worth studying and worth characterizing, but I think I would avoid putting hard requirements here. Thank you. Ecker? Yeah, Eric Scorla. Um, yeah, I can go Richard. Um, in particular, um, we, uh, I'm not entirely sure I know how to define non-transferability. Um, in the face of arbitrary collusion between the person whom the token was issued and the person who's redeeming it, then they might as well be the same person. So it's like, like actually defining it seems quite not straightforward. So. Um, um, I'm aware of attestation, but that's not actually necessarily help. So, um, uh, so, so I think like we had the I, I, I'd like to see someone propose a, a, a strict definition, certainly before we create the charter. Thank you, Ben Kaduk. Uh, this is Ben Kaduk. Uh, so whenever I hear the phrase, you know, this is something for more study, I have to ask, is this a matter for the IETF or a matter for the IRTF as a research problem? Uh, Alex Davidson speaking. Uh, I think this is something that we can, I mean, we have the protocol now, the, the core protocol that we plan to use. Uh, there might be some minor changes to that, but uh, I don't think the API that we're going to use is going to change uh, substantially. So I think this is something that we could study. Uh, but again, I mean, it would be, it'd be good to get some consensus on that. I think I, I was focused most on the transferability question that would just come up in the previous couple of speakers. Uh, I agree that the, the protocol itself is something we can think about. Right, right, yeah. It's a, but um, the transferability question is inherent to the protocol design. Uh, so uh, what, what I meant to say is that um, I think the transferability, uh, the like the the ability to transfer tokens is something that I think we we can do here in, in like with as part of this process. Thanks. Okay, back to Joe. Okay. Um, I don't think that we have, uh, I think we've kind of covered what we came here to cover. Um, and now it's a matter of uh, working out the charter details on the list. So, yeah, I think uh, Ben's suggestion of uh, proponents going off and reworking the charter to based on today's discussion and then having that discussion on the privacy pass list is a good one. So, okay. Thank you all for coming. This has Thank been you. a good experience. So. Before you leave, I want to remind everybody to please, again, uh, put your name in the virtual blue sheet. If you haven't done so already, I'll note that we've had over 160 people in our WebEx today. We do not have 160 names in our blue sheet. So uh, remember that entering your name in the blue sheet is not optional. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, I guess we're uh, free to go. You get a couple minutes back before the next session. Goodbye and thanks for the minutes. <laughs>